So we will start right on time to keep the commencement activities moving like the well-oiled machine that, the, that all of our, our good people who are out in the, in the foyer uh, do. In lieu of an introduction, I was told that they're going to put up my bio on the screen there. And so rather than introducing myself, you can, uh, you can read my bio rather than, than listen to the talk if you would like. Uh, my name is Ted Fisher. I'm a professor of anthropology here. Uh, I also direct our Center for Latin American Studies. Uh, we have just a, a little bit of promo. We have one of the world's foremost centers of Latin American studies, which you may not know. It's a little unusual, Vanderbilt being in the center of the country, uh, but we've had a long-standing relationship with Latin America, and uh, I'll use a couple of examples from Latin America in my talk today. It's a real treat uh, to be asked to do this and to be able to speak to you today. Uh, it has been a, a privilege to teach your kids, and I, I don't say that lightly, uh, over the last four years, and a joy. I think I have one of the best jobs in the world, being able to interact with a bunch of bright young people all of the time and be challenged about ideas and have great discussions. So uh, and, and this is a wonderful way. For those of you who are students, maybe this is your last lecture of your, of your university career, uh, and for those of you who are parents, it's a nice way maybe of seeing behind the scenes and, and what your, your, your students uh, are up to. So uh, I want to start today, before I actually get into my talk, I want to start today with a, uh, a little game. Uh, and I want to ask folks, uh, come on in. No, there's no problem. Come on in. Uh, how many people have ever played the ultimatum game? Has anybody ever heard of the ultimatum game or played it one to a couple of people. So those of you who know this game, it's kind of the thing where you don't want to know the full context of the game before you play. So it's just sort of keep your knowledge to yourself. Uh, when we play this game, and I play this game in the field, I work in Guatemala and I work in other countries, and when we play this game in the field, we play with real money. So I'm going to have to ask you, and I didn't get a budget for this talk, and so I'm gonna, we're just going to play with pretend money today. So I'm going to have to ask you to suspend your disbelief, and for this to really work, though, we have to pretend that we are playing with real money. Now, at the same time that this lecture is going on, there's another lecture in the auditorium across the, across the hall here going on, uh, probably with about the same number of people. And so the way I'm going, we're going to pretend play this game is that each of you are going to be player A. You're going to be player A in a game, and you are going to be matched with, this is just pretend, it's not for real, but you're going to be matched with someone in the other room over there who will be your counterpart, and that person will be player B. In this game, you have one move and only one move to make, and the same goes for player B. And so pretend we're playing with real cash. Let's say that we're going to play with, normally when we play this in the field, we play with a day's wages, but let's just say $100 for simplicity's sake today. Uh, and so I'm going to give each of you as player A 10 $10 bills. I'm from Alabama, so that's T-E-N and not T-I-N. You'll have to excuse my accent. Uh, 10 $10 bills uh, that you have. So you have $100, 10 $10 bills. Your one move in this game is going to be that you have to offer a percentage of that $100 to your partner, who you will never see again. It's anonymous. You'll never know who they are. Uh, but you offer a percentage of that $100 to player B. Now, once you make your offer, I take your offer over and I tell your corresponding partner, player B, okay, you've been offered this amount. And let's say that you offer uh, $20. Uh, if player B can either then accept your offer or reject your offer. If player B accepts your offer, then the money is split as you've offered it. You, if you offered $20, you would keep 80, and player B would keep 20. If you had offered 50, you would keep 50, player B would keep 50. If you had offered 80, you would keep 20, player B would keep 20. Um, so you have one move, you've got $100, 10 $10 bills, you have to offer a percentage of that $100 to player B. Player B will decide to accept or reject your offer, and then if it's accepted, you get to split the money and keep the money, and if it's rejected, the money goes back to the pot and nobody gets any of the money. So think about this for a minute. Don't talk about it with your, with your family or your friends, but just think about it for a second. And does everybody have an offer? Everybody ready with an offer? How many people would offer $10? $30. 
fifty dollars. Sixty? Seventy? Eighty? Ninety? A hundred. Okay. Zero, 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 zero. Perfect. Okay, we're going to come back to that in a few minutes, but I just wanted to start off with this, uh, with this game. So I'm an anthropologist. I'm a cultural anthropologist. We anthropologists always have to give our credentials in terms of where we've done our field work. I've done most of my field work in Guatemala with the Maya of Highland Guatemala. I've also done substantial work in, in Germany. I'm trying doing all the G countries, Guatemala, Germany. I guess I'll have to go to Ghana next. Uh, and I've dabbled a bit in, in Mozambique and, and the United States. Um, I've also do some consulting for, for government agencies and private companies, so I'm a bit of a non-traditional uh, anthropologist in that sense. Uh, I've worked in all these different places, but what ties it together is one abiding question, and that is, what are the effects of cultural norms and moral values in different parts of the world on people's economic decisions and economic behavior? How do people act differently around the world when they interact uh, with the economy? And the cash on the table, the somewhat enigmatic title of the talk, the cash on the table, I'm going to argue today that anthropology has a lot to bring to the table in terms of understanding economic behavior and in complementing uh, e economic uh, paradigms. So I'm an anthropologist who wants to talk to you about economics, uh, which uh, I hope this wasn't bait and switch. Uh, uh, and I spent a lot of my time talking with econ economists and working with economists, and I have to say, each discipline has its own language, and it's really been a long process. It's been several years of collaboration with my economics colleagues uh, to reach the point where we can actually uh, work together. Uh, and in fact, if you're interested, if this, if this lecture piques your interest, I, I recently recorded an episode of uh, Planet Money with a, an economist, Bob Frank from Cornell, and we walked around the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and he gave an economic perspective on all the storefronts and public buildings and things, and I gave an anthropological perspective. Uh, so there's a, a, a lot to, to, to complement those two. So today I want to make essentially three arguments or three propositions. Uh, the first, and this may be something that you would be very willing to accept, the first proposition is that uh, we are driven by more than just self-interest in our behavior. Moral values, for example, inform lots of our economic behavior. Now, this may seem apparent uh, to, to most folks, uh, but in fact, when we're talking, you know, a lot of things that are apparent in the social sciences, we actually have to go and, and figure out and prove uh, uh, common sense. And when we talk about economics, in the discipline of economics, and I think in public discourse, we often think of economics as being a world apart, uh, you know, economic behavior not being driven by emotions and beliefs and moralities, but by the hard calculus of, of rational choices. And to try and fit the complexity of human behavior into economic models, economists have to, for very good reason, sort of make a number of assumptions about what drives us. Uh, and very often these assumptions could be boiled down to that human beings are rational, self-interested actors who, in acting in the world, try and maximize our preferences. And I'm going to come back to these terms in, in, in just a few minutes. Uh, and we need to assume humans to be this way in order to make our economic models work. And these models do work, and they do explain a lot of human behavior, but my argument today is only to an extent. Uh, the resulting view of human beings, what we might call homo economicus, uh, is, well, we could paraphrase uh, Oscar Wilde's famous saying that uh, they know the price of everything and the value of nothing. It leaves out a large component of what motivates us as human beings. Surely, we are driven by self-interest, uh, but not only. And this is where anthropology brings a lot to the table. So that's my first proposition. We're not purely rational, self-interested agents. Uh, morality, ideas about fairness, cultural norms play into our economic, uh, our economic behavior. Second is that we've, uh, there's an increasing body of research that is showing that income and material well-being are very important to us, but in terms of 
overall well-being, in terms of life satisfaction, this isn't the only thing that matters to us leading the good life. Uh, we would all like to make a little bit more money. Uh, we would probably all like to have a little bit more stuff. Uh, but we're learning more and more the power of some obvious things like health and education being important components of overall well-being. But even some more, you know, fluffy cultural things like power. Feeling that you have power to make decisions about your own future, that you have power over your own destiny, that you can make decisions about your life and then enact those decisions. This turns out to be hugely important to people's sense of well-being around the world. Uh, dignity, uh, uh, life satisfaction, subjective senses of, of, of life satisfaction. And so my second point that I want to make is that uh, if we look at the ends of the economy in terms of well-being and not just maximizing income, it makes us, it shifts our, the kaleidoscopic lens just a little bit and makes us look at things in a different way. And third, my third point today is that the way we talk about and frame our economic decisions has a significant impact on our overall well-being. Okay, so those are the points that I want to make. What we as anthropologists do is tell stories a lot of times. Uh, and so let me start with a couple of stories that sort of started me on this path of thinking about this. A few years back, uh, we were, my family and I, we were in Germany over the Christmas holidays. My wife is German and we were visiting her family in Hamburg. And my son uh, desperately wanted to see the new Harry Potter movie that had just come out. Uh, and part of the reason we had gone to Germany was to sort of escape the, the commercialism, you know, the, the normal uh, frantic pace, frenetic pace of, of, of holiday life in the States. But Johannes had been such a good sport and he had sat through all of these interminable meals and, and family gatherings that we felt we couldn't deny him this, this simple, easy pleasure. So we look up in the paper. There's a, the first showing of the day. There's a neighborhood theater uh, where we were staying in Hamburg that had a showing at 5.30 of the movie. So we, in good, uh, we, we uh, made plans to go. Uh, we left uh, in good German fashion. We, we arrived very early, led by my, my good German wife. We got there uh, around 5 o'clock, only to see a long line coming out from the, 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 the ticket window. So we stand in line. We finally make it up to the ticket window, and we buy the last three tickets that were seated together. And those of you, who, if you've gone to the cinema in Germany, you know it's assigned seating. Uh, it's more like a, a theater here in the States. So we buy the last three tickets, much to the dismay of the families that were in line still behind us, right? And so I asked the woman. It turns out it was a small family-owned theater, and the, the owner was there taking our money. And so I asked her, why don't you have a matinee? There's obviously a big demand. It's the holidays. You could have sold out another showing. Why didn't you have a matinee? And she pauses for a minute. She, she was wearing half rim glasses, I remember very well, and she sort of looks at me over her glasses and like she doesn't know where to start, huh? this crass American. What, how am I going to explain this uh, to him? And she says, you know, during the holidays, kids should be at home with their families. They should be out in the park playing. They shouldn't be coming to the movies in the, in the afternoon during, during the holidays. And she seemed to be, I was a little bit surprised, and she seemed to be pleased at my surprise, right, sort of educating this, this, uh, this, this American. But it struck me that this was very odd. This was a small business owner foregoing significant income to pursue an idea of some common good, some nebulous idea of how people should act uh, in the world. Now, in economic terms, economists often talk about opportunity cost. If you forego something that's like, you know, foregoing income is like paying income. And so this woman was essentially paying a voluntary tax to support an idea of what families should be like in Germany over the, over the holidays. And it struck me as, as odd, as, a, as a, a, a morality that was at odds with the rational expectations of much economic theory uh, and a stance that would be foreign to most American entre entrepreneurs uh, and maybe most Americans, including myself. So, and this made me think back to other cases of seemingly irrational, these economic anomalies, irrational behavior that I had seen in Guatemala. 
So I've done most of my field work in Guatemala in a town called Tecpan. It's a farming town. It's a, we would consider it to be a very poor town, subsistence farmers. Mayan farmers, half the population of Guatemala are Mayan Indians. Uh, my wife and I lived there for a long time and we did our field work there. Uh, and we knew one couple who had a great success story. They had done really against all odds, done well in high school, gotten a scholarship to college, graduated from college in Guatemala City, the capital, uh, learned Spanish as well as their native Cachiquel Mayan language, and had gone on to get very well-paying jobs with international organizations. One of them worked for USAID, and one of them worked for UNICEF. So my wife and I are living in Tecpan, and one day they show up. Uh, it was a Thursday. I remember it was a Thursday, uh, Thursday morning. And they said, would you like to go with us to our fields to help us with what they were calling the second harvest? Now, they maintained their ancestral uh, lands, agricultural lands, outside of Tecpan, but they hired people to do the work since they were living in the capital city and having these professional jobs. But we go out with them, and it's quite a, quite a haul. We got to drive for about 45 minutes. They probably ask us because I had a car. Uh, we drive for about 45 minutes. We got to walk for about 30 minutes. We get to their fields, and we spend all day long collecting the corn, the maize, that the hired workers had left behind when they had done the harvest. So these are just like ears of corn here and there, under the bush and, you know, hidden in the, uh, uh, on, the, on the stalks. We spend all day, we cook a meal, we have lunch there, and we fill up, they collect corn in, in Guatemala in nets, and they're, they're pretty big nets, about this size. So we fill up a couple of these big nets of corn, and then we haul them back. And on the way back to the car, I was like, Really, why are we doing this? Uh, you know, come on, we're all professionals. The uh, value of this corn, this is like, you know, $3 worth of corn. You took off work today. The money that you could have made working today could have bought all this corn and more. Uh, you know, my time, I value it at, at, at more than this. It, back to these opportunity costs, right? They were foregoing working uh, to, to collect this little bit of corn. So it was a high opportunity cost in, in economic terms. But again, sort of like the, the, the cinema owner in Germany, you know, they sort of, uh, anthropologists get this all the time, these exasperated, I can't believe you're asking such a basic question. And they, they said, you know, it's not about the money. Uh, corn, human beings were made from corn in the Mayan origin myth. It is shahan in the native language. It's taboo to, uh, to degrade corn, to, to let it fall on the ground, to waste corn in some way. Uh, and these are lands that our father and our grandfather and our great-grandfather had worked uh, before them. And so this was about a lot more than just collecting a little, you know, five bucks worth of corn. This was about carrying on a tradition. It was about an affective tie to the land. It was about a connection with ancestors. Uh, and it was really about a, a, a moral commitment to, to all of this that, that corn embodied. Now, I tell these two stories uh, because they, they point to the importance of, of moral values and cultural norms and economic decisions that people make in their daily lives. These aren't rational, self-interested automatons. They're individuals making economic decisions based on culturally particular and deeply held moral values, valuing something other than narrow uh, self-interest. And this is true not only in exotic Guatemala and distant Germany, but here today. I mean, when you go to the grocery store, uh, how often increasingly we are faced with opportunities to express our moral values through our purchases, right? I mean, fair trade coffee is booming, organic produce, uh, green products. Uh, in all of these ways, we're encouraged to sort of express our moral values through our economic decisions. The fact is that we do often act self-interestedly, and we can learn a lot from viewing uh, our actions from these angles. But this isn't the only thing that motivates us. And in fact, reducing our motivations to nothing more than rational, maximizing self-interest uh, can lead to a cynical worldview that really becomes uh, self-fulfilling in, in, in many ways. I was at a talk last week. We had the, the mayor of Bogota in town to give a talk, and he did a really interesting thing. He asked folks what motivates their own behavior, and he gave three alternatives. One, doing the right thing, just sort of, I believe in what I do, and so I do what I do because I believe in it, or fear of sanctions. It's, it would be illegal not to do this. Other people would, would, uh, would look ill of, upon me. 
And the vast majority of the audience, he asked people to vote, and the vast majority of the audience says, my own behavior I do because it's the right thing to do. I'm upholding some values that I, that I hold. And then he asked people, what do you think motivates other people? And the majority of the audience said that they thought other people were motivated by fear of sanctions. So, and I think that this is probably broadly true. We see ourselves as differently than we see other people. And for those of you who are, are uh, and, and I think many of you probably are, who are, you know, who have to manage other people in daily lives, you, you realize this as well, right? Financial incentives are very, very important, but they're not the only thing. People also want to feel like they're part of a larger project. They want to feel like they're being respected in the job that they do, that there's some dignity to it. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's, it's not just about uh, the finances. Okay, so I want to return to the ultimatum game then uh, at this point. I love playing this game because it's a great example of sort of the limitations of except we have a bunch of really rational people in this audience, this is unusual, uh, of, of rational self-interest. So if we were, if we are, were these rational, maximizing, self-interested individuals, what would be the best move in playing this ultimatum game? It, because both sides would be satisfied, half and half. Okay, I'm going to come back to that in just a second. Is there another? Offer ten, because the only real player in the game is player B, so their option is not playing or something. And, and it would be foolish to accept that option. Actually, I mean, there is no way to rationalize someone saying no, even spite doesn't make sense. There is no other answer but yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. So the most rational choice would be uh, to offer the lowest possible amount, just as you so eloquently said. The player B's option is 10 or nothing, and so if they're being rational as well, let's assume both players are being rational, they're going to accept 10 because 10 is better than, than, than nothing. We've maximized our returns. We get to keep 90, and player B gets to keep uh, 80. And so we had a lot of people who were playing this way. However, as whenever we play this game, and this is true across cultures, interestingly enough, although there's some, some variation, the majority of people offer 50, offer half of the pot. And the reason why is sort of this, uh, what you were saying, why, why, let's say somebody, let me actually ask somebody who offered uh, 20 or 30, why, why did you do that? Who's, who's somebody who offered 30, 30 dollars? There was a hand up earlier. I didn't imagine this. <laughs> or 20. Who, uh, who? No? Nobody wants to talk? Or 40. Who offered 40? Yes, ma'am. I felt that they may feel like um, that's fine. Well, you're getting all this money for nothing. So 40 seemed like it was enough to make it worth it. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great. Is that what you? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So maybe we're playing rationally, and we want to maximize our income, but we're assuming that the other person isn't going to be rational, and is, and so we offer an amount large enough that we know that they'll accept, and we're sort of hedging our bets and, and being very rational that way. In fact, and think about this for yourselves, uh, in fact, in the United States, offers less than 40% uh, of the pot are often rejected at very, very high rates they're rejected. Uh, and I, I know this is out of the context, it only really works when you're playing the game, but think about it. If you, if you knew the other person had 100 bucks and they had offered you 20, would you accept or reject? Many, many people would reject that offer. But that's not rational, right? Uh, that's a great question, and there's, a, there's, some, there's mixed evidence on this. Some other people, not, not myself, but some other people have played with large sums and small sums, and so it doesn't seem to, small sums do make a difference. People just don't care so much. Uh, large sums, once you get up to $100,000, uh, $1, there's not much difference. When I played this in Guatemala, we played with a day's wage, which would be, that's significant enough that people are like, you know, there's some real, real skin in the game. Uh, what's fascinating here, I find, is both the offer, sort of either assuming that people are being irrational or wanting to be fair, but also these rejection rates. Think back to what, uh, the term we used earlier, right, opportunity cost. If you reject an offer, that's the equivalent of paying that amount of money to punish someone that you don't know and will never see again for acting in a way that you think might be unfair. So the other person knows the terms of the game 
they do know, and I should have said that from the very beginning, the other person knows how much money you got. So they know sort of this fairness angle to it. Uh, but so if people who reject $20 or $30, that's the equivalent of them paying $20 or $30 again to punish somebody, uh, which I find fascinating, especially since they're never going to see this person again. And it sort of clues us off that there's something else besides just rational self-interest going on here. I will mention in Tecpan in Guatemala, the town where I work, average offers, average offers, What's the average going to be here? Uh, it's going to be th upper 30s probably, huh? or 40. Somebody's better at math than I am. Anyway, it's going to be around here, which is pretty common for the US. Uh, in TechPon, average offers were 51% of the pot. Now, that's most everybody offering 50% and one or two people offering uh, just a little bit more. Uh, and there is such a strong cultural norm in TechPon and uh, in this Mayan community about not being greedy and about not appearing as being greedy. Now, we played this anonymously and we told people nobody will ever know, but still, it's so ingrained that they want to seem super generous. The only higher offer ever recorded in the world, uh, some other researchers did, is among the La Malera of Indonesia, a whaling group. Uh, and whalers tend to highly value cooperation over competition. Whaling by yourself isn't very effective <laughs> usually, you know. You require a group to, uh, to work together to do that. Uh, but there's something uh, other than, than, than rational self-interest at work here. It's a clear concern with fairness. Now this fairness, when I use morality in this talk, I'm using it in a very abstract sense, not, not like absolute moralities that are given to us by any particular religious tradition or something, but just this broad sense of every culture has its own sort of moral norms. Uh, now, this might be moral behavior, uh, sort of pro-social behavior being generous, uh, or it could be anti-social behavior or sort of anti-moral, you know, jealousy and envy. Uh, being played out this way. But in either case, uh, large majorities around the world uh, that play this game uh, see, you know, play it to, to, to do something other than, than just maximize their returns, or at least assuming other people aren't, uh, aren't being so rational. Okay, uh, let me shift gears uh, slightly and then try and pull this all back together in the, in the third section of the talk. Um, what we, I would argue that we all want the good life. Uh, and this is sort of an, uh, a term that comes from Aristotle, the good life or the fulfilled life. Uh, we, Maya people, we here in this room, Samoans, Germans, everybody has an idea of that they want something more and better out of their lives. Now, what exactly that entails varies enormously from people to people, and we often fight vigorously over what the terms of, the, of what the good life might be. But I think it's very important to, to, to keep this in mind that people are striving for something uh, in their lives. Uh, and I'm going to argue that it's something more than just uh, material well-being. Uh, it's interesting, the study of this, and there's been a lot of studies done lately, uh, fall into two camps. Studies about the good life done in the United States and in Europe and in the developed world are happiness studies. And there's a booming trend, in, and you've probably, you may have seen some of these books or read some of these books by economists and other social scientists looking at happiness. When we look at this in the developed, developing world, and this is the research that I participate in, uh, we call it multidimensional poverty. What are the various dimensions of poverty? Which is really sort of interesting uh, linguistic coding in itself, right? It's our holistic well-being is happiness, and those poor people in Guatemala, theirs is multidimensional uh, uh, poverty. This is an area of study that's really taken off over the last few years, and famously being adopted by a few countries. In particular, Bhutan, the tiny kingdom of Bhutan, has a gross national happiness index. Uh, and by law, their, their laws are supposed to maximize gross national happiness rather than just gross national income. Income is an important component of this, and I don't want to, to deny that in, in, in any way, but it's not the only component. But it's not just crazy little Bhutan. Uh, Sarkozy in France uh, has put together a, 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 a blue ribbon commission that's looking for ways to look at holistic well-being. Cameron in, in Britain is uh, doing the same thing. Chile and Brazil, lots of countries are adopting uh, these, these new measures of, of well-being. Now, well-being includes income, as I've said, but it also includes 
health, education, and then some other things, leisure time, social relations, the value of social relations, agency or power, as I mentioned earlier, the belief uh, that we have uh, control over our own destinies, uh, and dignity. Uh, dignity in sort of a negative sense of, uh, you know, is one discriminated against, does one feel shame, but also in a positive sense, sort of the dignity that goes along with having a job, with having a productive vocation in life. Uh, and so what, when we're looking at well-being cross-culturally, we're increasingly looking at all of these multiple dimensions. So what is the good life and how do we pursue it? Economic models talk about preferences, which are what we want uh, in life. We pursue our preferences. And in theory, preferences can be anything. Uh, and in that sense, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty open paradigm, right? We have certain preferences in life, and in living our life, we pursue those preferences. Now, in theory, that's, that's, that's open and ecumenical and, and, and widely acceptable. In practice, what we can, the sort of preferences that we can record tend to be economic transactions. What we buy, uh, what we buy or what we invest our money in. And so, in fact, when, uh, when we model in economics, when we model preferences, we're most often talking about these, what are called revealed preferences. Economists make a distinction between stated preferences, the crazy things that we say we want or that we would like to do, and revealed preferences, what we actually do. And most economics models say that we have to privilege revealed preferences. These are people's true preferences. When the, when the rubber hits the road, when the money, when the cash changes hands, it's these true preferences that reveal what we, what we really want. Now, this creates a tautology. People want what they buy because they buy it. And it also ignores the, the, the all too common scenario that I face anyway, like on the supermarket shelves or in the voting booth, of being faced with alternatives where I choose the lesser of two evils. They don't, what I choose doesn't really reflect my real preferences, my ideal world, but you know, I don't want candidate B to win, so I'm going to vote for candidate A. Uh, or they don't really have the kind of cereal that I would like to eat, but I'll choose this, this thing that looks closest uh, to, to uh, what we have. So what if we don't really want what we buy sometimes, but we're left uh, with, with no alternative? Uh, now, I say this uh, to lead up to this, this third part of the talk where I try and pull this all together. Uh, my argument is that stated preferences, when we talk about what people want out of their life, uh, stated preferences tend to be more long-range, they tend to be more pro-social, uh, and they tend to be more concerned with these elements that uh, feed into this holistic sense of, of, of well-being uh, than revealed preferences uh, do. So let me give you a couple of examples about, uh, about how this might work, which is my third point uh, about framing choices. What makes us happy and what promotes the good life isn't always what first seems apparent. And here, let me make another distinction. Uh, in these studies, happiness studies, uh, they distinguish between happiness or what's called hedonic happiness. Are you happy right now? Think about this. This is a true question. Are you happy right now? The vast majority of people say, yeah, I'm happy right now. You know, I woke up, my wife didn't yell at me this morning. The kids got off to school. I, you know, I didn't get fired. Yeah, I'm pretty happy. We sort of adapt our, our sense of daily happiness to, to what's going on in our lives at any one time. We get very different results. I, th I find this fascinating. We get very different results if we ask people, look back over the course of your whole life and how satisfied are you with your life as a whole? And we tend to get very different results. And those are much more pegged toward income, interestingly enough, right? People who earn more money tend to be more satisfied with their whole life, probably because you know, there, there aren't those opportunities that couldn't be taken because of, of, of material circumstances. But there's this difference between happiness and, and life satisfaction. And sometimes the way in which economic choices are framed for us, are presented to us, they tend to promote some sort of immediate happiness, is what I'm about to argue, rather than some sort of long-term life satisfaction. And let me give you a couple of examples. One comes from a study some colleagues of mine at Cornell did, and they asked folks, and with all of these kinds of, of hypothetical questions, you have to adjust it for your own income levels, but they asked folks, would you rather earn $80,000 a year and get an average of seven and a half hours of sleep a night, $80,000 a year, 
seven and a half hours of sleep, or 140,000 a year and sleep for six hours on average a night. 80,000, uh, seven and a half hours of sleep, 140,000, six hours of sleep. 70% of respondents in this study said that they would rather make less money and sleep more, which is interesting, right? Yeah, it's sort of surprising, I think. Okay, but the real kicker comes, they did a week later, they did follow-ups and debriefed these people, and they said, okay, we're really going to offer you this job. They knew they, they weren't, but they said, pretend we're really going to offer you this job. What would you choose? And then a majority of people who even said that they would choose less money and sleeping more, when it came down to that moment, they were like, no, we would take the higher paying job and sleep less. Uh, so that's interesting. And it, it's, I'm going to give a couple, but it's sort of, you know, what we say we want and then what we actually do. Sometimes there's a disconnect. And on the one hand, we could easily say, well, what we actually do is, is what's important. But I would say it is important, but we also have to take what we say as being important as, as well. So uh, another, my, my friend and colleague, Bob Frank, who's also at Cornell, uh, presents it this way. Would you rather live in a, well, on the first, uh, one uh, way to put this is, would you rather live in a 4,000 square foot house or a 2,500 uh, square foot house? Easy choice, right? 4,000 square foot house. But then if we frame this with all of the implications, would you rather live in a 4,000 square foot house with a 45 minute commute or a 2,500 square foot house with a 10 minute commute? What is this going to mean for the amount of time that you get to spend with your family? What is this going to mean for the amount of time that you get to invest in social relationships? And if you frame it that way, people's choices change uh, really dramatically. And we have a lot of research that shows that investment in social relations has a, has a big impact on our long-term happiness. Part of this is the old cliché which is really true, you know, nobody on their deathbed ever wished that they had worked for an extra hour. It's, uh, you know, these other things uh, tend to be more important at the, at the end of our lives. So an economist would say that we have to give the most weight to what folks actually do, this revealed preference or this true preference. Uh, and yet what I would argue is that we also need to take seriously the stated preferences of what folks say uh, they would like, how they would like uh, uh, things to be. And I think that there's often an immediate pull of, of hedonic pleasures, of immediate rewards uh, that entice us to make decisions that might be counter to our long-term better judgment. A clear area to see this is in addiction, right? How many people who smoke say that they want to smoke? The va you know, we've done surveys on this. The vast, you know, 98% of people who smoke say, I don't want to smoke. But they're sort of thinking about this in these long-term, the stated preference, right? This longer term, what would I like to be like in my life? Well, over the long term, but like this immediately, there's a pack of cigarettes right there, and yeah, I don't want to be a smoker, but boy, I'm going to smoke one right now just because there's that immediate pull of, uh, of, of, of the cigarette. Now, there's been some interesting research done on ways in which we can sort of frame choices in ways that help people uh, live up to what they say they would like uh, uh, the good life for them to be. Uh, one, and you may have seen some of this research, there was a, a not quite a bestseller, but a bestseller for an academic book, I guess, uh, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein. Uh, Cass Sunstein is now Obama's regulatory czar. They wrote a book a couple of years ago called Nudge, in which they promoted an idea that they call, and this is going to seem uh, paradoxical, uh, paternalistic libertarianism. Uh, and what they said is we can just sort of, we don't want to remove choices from anybody, but we just frame their choices a little bit differently. And the one area in which their research has really taken off in practice and has been a huge success is making the default on re uh, contributions to your retirement account higher. The vast majority of people will just go along with whatever the default is. And so you have a retirement plan, the, the mandatory contribution was 2%, let's bump it up to 6%. Uh, people can still opt out of that 6%, so you're not reducing their liberty at all. You're just changing the default. And this is, and most people even who are, who are participating in these schemes say, yeah, I'm glad we did this. This is, a, this is a good thing. Another mechanism they've used with the retirement accounts is promising a percentage of future raises. Future raises, again, these stated, these long-term stated preferences. Oh, a future raise, yeah, I'll give half of my future raise to my retirement account, uh, although you wouldn't contribute that much out of your current, uh, your current paycheck. The other way, and I don't want to go off on this too much, they have such great examples, though. The other thing that they've done is organizing school lunchroom uh, 
what do you call it, like the, the, the cafeteria line, right? And where you place chips and cookies versus fresh fruits and vegetables makes a huge difference on what people select. And so you start off the line and you got a big bowl of grapes and oranges and apples and then down at the end of the line, you know, at the bottom of the counter, you've got the chips and all this other stuff. It dramatically increases the amount of fresh fruit and vegetables that kids choose. You're not restricting them from choosing. They still have the power to make the same choices that they want to, but you're framing these choices in a slightly different way, uh, which is good. So perhaps we're all a bit like... You know, the classic example would be uh, 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 Odysseus and sort of tying ourselves. We know the sirens are going to be screaming and we're, we're not going to be able to resist that temptation. So we tie ourselves to the mass to stop ourselves from, uh, from doing this. Um, and these are called, in the literature, these are called pre-commitment advices. We decide something now about how we want to be and enforce that uh, in the future. And I find it fascinating. There's been an explosion over the last couple of years of uh, market responses of, of, of giving us possibilities uh, to, to do this. Uh, so a couple of products. There's a Intoxilock, which, uh, where you have to blow into a, a thing just before you start your car. So it won't let you start your, you won't let you drive while you're drunk. Uh, there is a no text program that stops you from texting in your car. You can do these things, maybe you've seen these, you can cut off your own internet connection obligatorily on your computer for a certain amount of time per day because it's that temptation, right? That email program is just right there and I know I'm gonna be tempted so I'm gonna decide ahead of time not to be tempted uh, in that way. And MasterCard even has a new, uh, a new program, an in control program that allows you to put uh, limits uh, below your your, your credit allowance uh, on, on your card. There's another, uh, another an internet startup uh, it lets you make, this is really interesting, make commitments that are enforceable by donations to charities that you don't support. So you can say, okay, I'm going to lose 10 pounds in the next year and you have to go actually to a facility and get weighed by an independent third party and they report this and then if you haven't lost 10 pounds at the end of the year you know uh, $200 of your money that you've put on a credit card already goes to whatever a you know a, a, a the National Rifle Association or an anti-guns right group or a pro-abortion group or an anti-abortion group whatever you don't like uh, and so it's an, a, an even more powerful uh, uh, motivating force. Uh, so, uh, given the immediacy, so I want to conclude with a, a, a little story. Uh, again, we tell stories in anthropology, and my recent work has been in, in Germany and looking at moralities and cultural norms and how they affect economic decisions. Uh, I found this really fascinating case. So, in Germany, by law, all eggs. My last book was Broccoli and Desire about Mayan farmers growing broccoli. My current book is about German egg buyers. I do quirky commodities in, in G uh, countries. Uh, anyway, German eggs are by law labeled with a numerical code from zero to three. All eggs. It's laser printed on the egg. There's a sign above every egg counter that sort of gives this scheme. Zero is organic free range and three is battery cage raised or, or industrially raised uh, chicken eggs. Uh, and this is a fascinating case for an economic anthropologist like myself because there are, these are morally loaded decisions, right? What kind of, of production you want to support. And here you've got this, this, this chart giving you these different moral values and then you have clear price differences and they're pretty significant. It's like, you know, a Euro 77 for, for, for battery cage raised eggs and probably 350, 360 for uh, organic free range. And so you have people having to make a moral decision with a clear Euro, dollar and cents, Euro and cents in this case, implication. Interviewing German shoppers across socioeconomic categories, the vast majority said that they bought zero or one eggs. Those are organic, free range, or just free range eggs. Which that's pretty amazing in itself. That there's, but Germany, it's a really green country. There's a sense of eco-consciousness. There's a sense of supporting, you know, so maybe not so surprising. But even at the lower socioeconomic categories, that, that held true. Then I looked at the sales data 
from these stores. <laughs> yeah, and you can guess. So only half as many people actually bought organic free range eggs as said they were buying organic free range eggs, which is interesting, right? Uh, and so on the one hand, we say, okay, well, the revealed preference is really true. They were just telling you what you wanted to hear as an interviewer. But I would say that there's probably something else going on there as well. It seems like when we deal in cash and when we deal with financial things and Germany is still very much a cash economy if you're at the egg counter and you're about you're going to go over and you're going to hand this cash over in just a few minutes and that it seems to trigger something in in our rationality about the way in which we think of things and it seems to trigger this real okay well I need to be prudent I need to save this money you know I'm going to I'm going to go to the the cinema later or whatever it is and I need a little bit more pocket money and it tends to make us very much uh, more conscientious about about saving money and maximizing money. Uh, but what about if we took seriously Germans uh, saying that they don't want to buy, that they would rather buy organic free range? Well, we have an experiment, and I'm going to go back and do some follow up work. It's January 1st of this year, Germany outlawed raising battery caged eggs. Uh, you can still import them from other EU countries for another two years, but this is going to be phased out. So there was a regulatory structure put into place reducing the range of choice. Uh, and my next research is I want to go back and ask people, is this, is this a case where, again, sort of paradoxically, maybe a reduction of choice increased their satisfaction with their purchases, which seems very counterintuitive to us, right? More choice is always better. Uh, although, personally, I'm on a regime right now of, of trying to make, I make so many choices in my daily life, I'm trying to reduce the range of choices. When I go into a supermarket, I buy the first thing, you know, the first brand name off the shelf, rather than like, you could, I could spend an hour comparing uh, you know, marshmallow fluff or something in the super, you know, what's the price per ounce and, uh, you know, how healthy is each thing. Uh, and so maybe sometimes we're happier having uh, fewer choices. So uh, to conclude, uh, my argument is that we need to take seriously what folks say that they would like to do uh, and that doing so, taking seriously these stated preferences makes us look at the economy and markets uh, in different ways. There's this growing body of scholarship, uh, which, which I contribute to, that suggests that there may be ways that we can structure market choices to help people increase what they themselves say that they would like out of their lives. So it's not like, you know, some Mandarin in Washington saying, oh, this is how people should be, although we have a lot of that, and going back to smoking, for example, that's a good example. And actually, that's not a good example of this because a lot of smokers might be happy that they can't smoke in their office place because they're a little bit healthier these days. But it's, this is, uh, what I'm suggesting is actually helping people fulfill their own uh, goals in, uh, in, in life that can help us uh, uh, reach some, some, some broader sense of, of well-being. Uh, and that's what I have to say. Thanks. Um, so we have a few minutes. Uh, we have a few minutes left before they kick us out. I would be very happy to answer questions. Yes, sir. That is a really good point, uh, and that's fascinating, and it's funny you should say that. Uh, a, a, a friend of mine, uh, his wife is pregnant the other day, and he was asking me, you know, what's it like to have kids? And I'm like, you can't say, to me it sort of falls, it, it, it does, it fits into that happiness. It's not happy, right? It's like if you've got kids, or you've got kids, it's, you know, it's, it's happy sometimes, and it's frustrating as hell sometimes, and it's, you know, but if we talk about it in terms of fulfillment, we could say that it's, it's, it's fulfilling in a way that's maybe not this giddy sense of happiness. Uh, yeah, exactly. It, yeah, exactly. Oh, that's true. It could have been a strategy. It could have been a clever strategic move. Uh, that's right. If you, 
you don't want too many of the Louis Vuitton handbags out because then it's going to reduce the demand and the exclusivity. Uh, That's true. Although she wasn't estimating me, I wouldn't have come back tomorrow. <laughs> but that's a good point. That's very. I, I can see. Uh huh. In divorce, I'll pay you off to leave me. And then, uh, <laughs> and then sometimes, like the other part, you get into divorce, will know that maybe they have some information, blackmail, and they know which money they have. They'll reduce, they'll be, refuse a 20% or a 40% and go for more. That's no, interesting. I need you if you give me 90%. And the first will say, okay, well, hey, take it, take it, just get rid of my life. I never want to see you again. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's, uh, I didn't think about that. As, that would be another interesting study. We could play the ultimatum game with, uh, with in troubled couples. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Who's looking at what, it, what makes the difference between state, state of preference and real preference? Or how are they looking at that? Are you saying that when they, they can't handle children, so too many children? Yeah, so my overall point would be that we. we uh, we say that a lot of times we set up, uh, uh, we assume that what people buy or what they do with their money really reflects the ideal world that they would like to live in. And that I'm saying that maybe we should be a little bit more free and sort of say we can imagine other sorts of worlds and sort of, uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, sir. No. No, no, no. Uh, I'm caricaturing, and I have an economist here in the front row, and so it's sort of keeping me in check a bit. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it's not true. In fact, in theory, it is. In fact, uh, I mean, economics these days is based a lot on mathematical modeling. And to get, you know, sort of to get at what is being modeled there, very often we have to focus on what people actually do. We can't, the, uh, uh, most economists would say we can't get inside people's heads. And so we have to go off of their behavior. Uh, and what I'm saying is what anthropologists would say in reaction to that is, yeah, behavior is really important. And very often it does reveal what we really, sometimes we say, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I never lie, and then we sometimes lie. Sometimes we say something different just to present uh, an image to the world. But I think also sometimes we say things that we would like to be true, but that we feel like we don't have the, the outlet to make true. Uh, So sometimes there is this duplicity that, that doesn't, yeah. Yes, ma'am. interesting sort of act of God we both suffered we <laughs> that's, that's fascinating <laughs> There, uh, there is. The older we get, the more long-term we our time horizons tend to be, and the more we tend to uh, make accounts of these kinds of things. That is, that's a very good observation. So uh, I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank you so much for it's uh, been a real treat to to be with you guys.